In square 7, you've decided who to study. In square 8, you have to decide what to do. Think of it like giving a party. You've decided who you want to invite, but you still need to decide where to have the party, what to serve, and what games to play. For an experiment, you must have something for the subjects to do. There's an independent variable you're going to manipulate, and a dependent variable you're going to measure. In our study, our preparations are minimal. Our independent variable is handedness. We don't have to manipulate this variable. Genetics did that for us. We simply selected it. The independent variable is anything an experimenter selects, manipulates, or induces. It is independent of the subject's wishes or behaviors. In contrast, a dependent variable depends on the subject's performance. If they don't do something we can see and measure, we can't do the experiment. The outcome or resultant variable depends on them. In other experiments, manipulating the independent variable can require a lot of equipment. Many experiments present stimuli to subjects, slides, sounds, patterns. Those stimuli must be created, and the equipment used to present the stimuli must be acquired. You use your theory and lit review to decide which equipment is needed and how to set it up. The best way is to find an experiment in your lit review that comes close to what you want to do and use it as a template for your planning. The idea is to replicate a portion of the original study and extend it in a new way. Replication is a core strategy of science. Experiments are repeated to eliminate spurious results. Finding consistent results is the first step to proving causality. If a causal relationship exists, each time an experiment is repeated, it should produce the same results. The more an experiment is replicated, the more sure you can be of its results. Using the Replication Plus method, you add to the replication of the original study, plus contribute your new knowledge as well. This is a great combination. For the new part of your study, you can use materials and procedures others have used previously, or you can make your own. If you're creating your own test or survey, the challenge is to leave your prejudices out of your questions. No matter how strongly you believe something to be true, it's in your best interest to make your items as unbiased as possible. As a research consultant, I worked with lots of companies, large and small, and my major challenge was convincing people who were emotionally invested in the results to avoid bias. Someone always wanted to ask questions in a way that would make the company look good. But I'd tell them, don't do that. Don't lie to yourself. You can lie to your customers and call it marketing, if your ethics allow. But lying to yourself is just stupid. Just as you worked hard to select a group of subjects that is just as representative of your population of interest as possible, make the conditions of your experiment fair. Don't give anyone an undue advantage. In our experiment, we're going to avoid injecting our bias by limiting handedness to one question. Are you left or right-handed? And by using a standardized test of intelligence. Unlike a party, an experiment has controlled conditions. That is, you must control the environment. You want to make sure no outside influences will impact the subject's performance. Take a tip from Clever Hans, the horse. In the late 1800s, a German farmer was amazed how smart his horse was. He taught his horse to add numbers. The horse could do simple addition problems and complex ones. The horse could also subtract, multiply, divide, and tell time. The farmer asked the question out loud, and the horse tapped the correct answer. It was amazing. People came from all around to see this horse. The farmer never charged admission. He was as amazed as everyone else and just wanted to show off his horse. A commission was formed to investigate this incredible horse. They found that even when someone other than the farmer asked the question, the horse got the correct answer the majority of the time. But to avoid confounding variables, variables that could influence performance, the horse was also tested without the farmer present. The horse did worse, but not by much. But when the horse was tested by someone who didn't know the answer, the horse's amazing ability disappeared. Clever Hans was indeed clever. He could read the body language of people asking the question. When they took a pause or tilted their heads or gave other cues, Hans stopped stomping his hoof. When there were no cues to read, Hans didn't know when to stop. Ever since Clever Hans, experimenters have tried to control for experimenter bias. This is the principle behind the double-blind study. In a blind study, 
The subjects don't know if they are getting the magic drug or the placebo. In a double-blind study, the person administering the drug also doesn't know which is the magic formula and which is simply sugar. If our study was a blind study, the subjects would not be told if they were left or right-handed. Since we're asking them the question, they can't be completely blind on the matter. What we can do is be stinky. We ask them lots of questions, including the one about handedness, and we don't tell them that the experiment is about handedness. To make our study double-blind, we'll have someone else administer and score the intelligence test too, so we won't know their handedness or IQ until the experiment is over. We'll also conduct our experiment in a quiet room, not outdoors by a busy road. We'll try to control for interruptions, loud music, and the presence of others. We'll have our test giver work one-on-one -on -one with each subject. In square eight, we worked hard to exclude any outside variable that might confound our results, and we got everything ready. In square nine, we must get permission to throw the party.